Previously on JRO's 11. I guess the last thing I'm gonna say is that if you guys get this video to, I don't know, something crazy like 20,000 likes, there is another game out there where you can get through the entirety of Kanto with a magic card. But I don't really think I'm interested in doing that right now. Hey everyone, how's it going? So, you guys seem to like the last video a lot. So we're gonna be doing this. We're gonna try and beat the entire game with just a Magikarp. Is it gonna work? I don't know. Is it gonna be fun? Probably not. But you guys wanted it, so you're gonna get it. Now, for those of you who didn't watch the last video, yes, I did attempt this in regular Red and Blue, and it was unsuccessful. There were a bunch of reasons, but basically it boils down to the fact that you need to get past the channelers in the Pokemon Tower who have ghost Pokemon and Magikarp in Generation 1 can only use two attacking moves, Tackle and Struggle if you run out of moves, both of which are considered to be normal attacks. There is no way to skip the channelers. Without beating the channelers, you can't get up to the top and get the Poke Flute. And without the Poke Flute, the second half of the game is inaccessible. So the run ended after beating Erika and that was still really, really tough. But I knew that in Fire and Leaf Green things were different, that there was at least a theoretical way to get through to the rest of the game. I just didn't know if I was actually going to be able to do it. And uh, that's what we're going to be figuring out in today's video. So before we begin with the run, just a quick rundown of the rules. Or really rule, the only rule is that in battle I'm only allowed to use a magic card. So if Magikarp faints, even if I have other Pokemon in my party, which I will have for HMs, which are necessary to progress through the game, I have to just either reset or let them faint. I cannot use them whatsoever. This is being done on an actual console, no emulator, no speed up, no save states, nothing like that. The only exception, and this is important, is that you cannot get a Magikarp as your starter or at the beginning of the game. So we will be using a cheating device to get our Magikarp since that's the question at hand. So yeah, that's enough preamble, let's start this run, and the run starts actually pretty boring, because I don't know of a cheat that will give you Magikarp as a starter, which is what I did in the red-blue run. So what I did instead is I picked Squirtle, and simply to pretend like it was a Magikarp, lost the first battle, because Magikarp would only learn Splash, so from a practical perspective, you would always just lose the first fight, and the rest of the early game wouldn't matter if you have a Magikarp or any other Pokemon, so we just do everything up until we get the Pokedex, we talk to the old man, and one great thing about Fire Red Leaf Green is that they give you five Pokeballs automatically, so we don't even have to spend on Pokeballs. We just have to use one of them to catch a Magikarp, but of course, Magikarp don't actually spawn in this area. So I'm going to save in front of Route 22 because there's a lot of level 5 Pokemon here and then I'm going to bust out my Game Shark, put in a code to make it that every encounter I get is Magikarp and then just catch the first Magikarp. Once this is done, I save, take out the Game Shark, put it away because we don't need it anymore and let the run begin. And probably the biggest barrier, there are many, but the biggest barrier to anyone actually wanting to do this is the very first area in the game, Viridian Forest. Because right now, we have a level five Magikarp that is very weak and knows no attacking moves, which for battling purposes is suboptimal, one could say. And there's a ton of trainers that stand in our way, many in fact, all of which need to be defeated and won't be defeated by a level five Magikarp with no attack. So we're gonna need to level this thing up, unfortunately, without being able to attack, pretty hard to level anything up. So what do we do? Well, thankfully, there is a move Magikarp can use. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to give it this move, and the move is Struggle. You might know Struggle, it's something that probably happened to you once or twice during your Pokemon playing days, and when you use up all the power points of all of your moves, in our case, the 40, yes, 40 power points of Splash, they couldn't have given it anymore if they wanted to, then you're able to use Struggle. Now, we could theoretically just encounter like Caterpie and whatnot and use up our splashes, but that actually wouldn't make a lot of sense because 
if we encounter any Pokemon that can attack us, we're going to take damage, we're going to need to heal, and if we go to the Pokemon Center, the easiest and freest way of healing, then all our power points are going to be restored, undoing all the progress we just made. So we need a way of encountering Pokemon that don't attack, so that we can use all our splashes, and then get Struggle. Thankfully, in Viridian Forest, there exist both Metapod and Kakuna, and in red and blue, they appeared at a very reasonable 40% rate. Unfortunately, in a move that would upset no one except for me in this one situation, Game Freak decided to reduce that rate significantly to 15%. So finding Metapod and Kakuna take a lot longer, a lot longer. But once you find them, remember last run, all we needed to do is just keep mashing A, use Splash 40 times, and then you get Struggle. Easy. <laughs> You're funny. No, you can't do that anymore. Because one of the reasons Red and Blue actually was unbeatable with Magikarp is that the opponents don't have power points. They can just use their moves infinitely. Starting in Gold and Silver, the AI does have power points. So Metapod and Kakuna will eventually run out of Harden. And wouldn't you know, Harden has 30 power points. Splash has 40. So we're going to still have 10 splashes left and the Metapod or Kakuna is going to start to attack us, which is exactly what we don't want. So we have to run away before that and encounter another Metapod or Kakuna, which takes a while because they're not super common. Then you do and you think, great, I've used up all my remaining splashes. I should just attack this Metapod or Kakuna, but that's also not a great idea because of how Struggle works. See, Struggle deals what they call recoil damage, which means that a percentage of the damage you deal to the opponent is dealt back to you. Now, one of the great things about Fired and Leaf Green is that the percent of damage Struggle deals back to you is significantly lowered. In Red and Blue, 50% of the damage you dealt to the opponent was dealt back to you. Now, a mere 25% is dealt back to you. However, and this is key, you will always get a minimum of one recoil damage. So when a Metapod has max defense, which it will after using 10 Hardens, every time you attack a Metapod or Kakuna, you will be dealing only one damage and you will be taking back one damage. Now, if you find a Metapod that hasn't used six Hardens, you will be dealing around three to four damage and you will still be taking back one damage. So it just makes more sense to find an additional Metapod or Kakuna. But, as you can imagine, this takes way more time than it used to because we're adding one more Metapod or Kakuna to the mix and they appear less than half as frequently as they used to. So you're probably thinking that Viridian Forest, which took five hours last time, is going to take even longer. Well, what if I told you that you were actually wrong? That in fact, there are some other, more subtle changes made in Fire Red Leaf Green that actually make this part of the game around two hours faster than it was in Red and Blue. It's true, I promise. And uh, let me talk about those changes. The first, something that really was a problem in the Red Blue run, was the fact that potions were so, so limited before you got access to Pewter City. You see, in both these games, there is a single mandatory trainer that you have to beat in Viridian Forest, and he's right near the exit to Pewter City. Now, back in Red and Blue, the Viridian City Pokemart, in spite of the fact there is literally a guy advertising the Pokemart who gives you a potion, they don't sell potions. That's not the case in Fire Red Leaf Green, and access to potions early on really, really speeds up the process because Eventually, money is going to run out. Money is super, super tight, and you're going to need a lot of potions to take on Brock. So, you can't just afford to use all your potions early on. You are going to have to use the Pokemon Center eventually, and every time you use the Pokemon Center, you're going to have to find two additional Metapod or Kakuna just to use all your struggle, just so you can probably find another one to gain a little bit more experience points. It's very frustrating, but... If you have some potions, you can limit those trips, and they are very, very helpful early on, since Magikarp has a lot less HP, and also is going to be dealing less damage, meaning you're probably not dealing ideal damage, by which I mean taking back as little recoil damage as possible. 
The second change that really helps is the addition of new trainers in Viridian Force. There are two additional trainers that weren't in Red and Blue, all of which have reasonably weak Pokemon, and you can defeat all of these for very useful experience points. But perhaps the most important difference, and the thing that makes these fights way, way easier, is the fact that you're taking back so much less damage in recoil. Being able to deal four damage for every one you take back as opposed to two is just so big in the early game when we're talking about such small amounts of HP. You're able to fight trainers earlier, you don't have to worry as much about losing a ton of health per battle because most of the health you lose is now going to be from the opponent attacking you as opposed to recoil damage. And by gaining a lot of XP earlier on, you're going to be leveling up, dealing more damage, having more hit points, being able to take more damage, and this snowballs and just makes the whole process a lot faster. But unfortunately, all is not good news, because one way I really sped up leveling up my Magikarp in Red and Blue was after I defeated the final trainer in Viridian Forest, I was able to go into Brock's gym and challenge this junior trainer, the Light Years guy. And this guy had two Pokemon in Red and Blue, a Diglett and a Sandshrew. Now I needed to level up my Magikarp to the point where it was able to take out the Diglett consistently without using any of my precious potions. I need them all for Brock and there isn't any more money to get to replace them. And once I was at that point, I would take out the Diglett I would lose to the Sandshrew, but every time you took out the Diglett, you'd get around 200 experience points, which is basically like taking out four Metapod or Kakuna, and that was back when they appeared at a 40% rate. So I was super excited to use that strategy again and avoid having to find Metapod and Kakuna at a 15% rate. But of course, in Fire Red Leaf Green, the junior trainer doesn't have a Diglett. No, he has a Geodude. And Geodude is not easy to take out without potions. So the strategy simply doesn't work. It didn't make any sense. I was not able to consistently take out the Geodude at any level. And thus, I was annoyed. I was really annoyed. So much so, I decided to do something that I thought was really, really dumb. But... I just didn't want to spend another four hours in Viridian Forest, which is what I was fully anticipating that I'd have to do. And I decided to just face Brock way before. If you remember the last time I faced Brock at level 19, and it still took me multiple tries to beat him. We're talking like 9-10 tries. This time though, it was different. And the reason is that struggle has changed in one other way. And it's pretty evident as soon as you start seeing this battle, how struggle has changed, it's no longer not very effective. It's regular effective because struggle is now a typeless move. It affects every Pokemon type and will always deal neutral damage. And you can also see that Brock's AI isn't amazing here. Geodude knows two moves, Tackle and Defense Curl. And it sure likes using Defense Curl, even though I don't think it's making much of a difference. And I only have one move, I just keep using struggle and eventually, once my health gets low enough, I will potion. And truth be told, Geodude used Defense Curl so many times, I only had to use a single potion to take out the Geodude. But then came out the Onyx. And Onyx is both more and less scary than it was back in Generation 1. On the surface, it looks scarier now that it has Rock Tomb, which deals about 7 damage each time it hits, plus it lowers speed. However, it can no longer use Screech, which lowered my defense, which is really what made the Onyx fight so difficult. Still, using three different attacking moves and Bind always taking off one health after it's used every subsequent turn, I hemorrhage health pretty quickly, combined with the fact that I am still using a move that takes recoil damage. But one thing that should be apparent is that Magikarp has extremely good defense, and so none of the moves are really doing that much damage, even a critical hit, wouldn't normally take me out. And so, I know when to use potions, and yeah, I played it a little risky. To be fair, I didn't actually expect to win. I believe this was my second try with Brock, and I was, like I said, just seeing if I could get past him quickly and move on to the rest of the game. But with some patience, some potions, and I got a little bit of luck, but I wouldn't say a crazy amount of luck, 
I was able to get past Brock at level 14. And that made me feel really good. And the footage didn't get deleted. I was very, very happy. But that happiness soon turned to, well, less happiness because I continued on to the rest of the game. And the rest of the game was quite a bit harder than I remembered because my Magikarp is no longer over leveled. In fact, it's kind of at the level it should be at for this point of the game. And it's also a Magikarp, meaning it's severely under leveled in a sense. So I actually went back to Viridian Forest to get Tackle because the one thing, although Tackle is a weaker move, I no longer have to worry about recoil damage. And of course the stat boost you get from being a level higher. But even with Tackle, the trainer fights were really tough. Like, I even could lose some of these fights if I got a little bit of bad luck. And every time I'd finish a fight, I had to run back to the Pokemon Center because I had taken a ton of damage. It took a really long time to get through. But slowly but surely, I made my way through Route 3, through Route 4 and Mount Moon. There weren't really any fights that were too interesting. There was one section I should mention that was kind of funny. The Team Rocket member won kind of close to the exit. I was not able to beat him. And no matter what I did, I wasn't going to win this battle. And I really didn't feel like leveling up to the point where I could beat him. Unfortunately, he's what they call a spinner. And every time I would try and run past him, he would notice me and engage me in battle. I couldn't seem to get past this guy. Except sometimes I could, and it took me like 10 minutes to figure out why that was. And basically, I learned the stealth mechanics of Pokemon, which is that when you're walking, he doesn't immediately turn around to notice you, but when you're running, he seems to do so. Now, I have been able to run past him before, so it's not like an all or nothing, but other than him, the rest of the fights were fairly normal, and we make it into Cerulean City. And this is where the biggest bottleneck of the run happened. It shocked me because this was a problem spot in the last run a little bit, but not to the degree it was in this run. It was kind of crazy. And let's talk about why. So you really only have two options at this point. You could go to Cerulean Gym or you can try and fight the rival. So I tried to fight the rival even though I was three levels lower and it didn't go well. I'm doing like no damage to Pidgeotto. Pidgeotto is doing around 8 damage every time it used Gust, plus it had Sand Attack and I was like missing every time. I knew that at this level, I wasn't going to beat the rival. So I tried Cerulean Gym. That wasn't working either. Forget about Misty, I wasn't able to beat a single one of her trainers in there, which indicated to me that this was going to be a really difficult section. So I did what you do when you can't progress. I went back to Route 4 and tried to go and level up a bit more and seeing if that would work. And I leveled up a bit more, five more levels to be exact, and tried again. And I still couldn't get past the Pidgeotto. Granted, I didn't get great luck. He got a couple of crits in, but he also didn't use any sand attack and I didn't miss. And his moves, which are all base 40 power, both Tackle and Gust, are doing 6 damage. So that's a little bit less, but it's still quite a bit, and I'm just not dealing enough damage. And I'm starting to realize that this is going to be a problem, because if I can't get past the Pidgeotto, how the heck am I going to deal with the Bulbasaur and the rest of his team? But I decided to go and try and level up a bit more. So now I'm at level 27, and I'm trying to face the Pidgeotto and his attacks are still doing six damage, plus I got a couple sand attacks, but overall, most of my moves hit, and I was able to take out the Pidgeotto, finally. Then, the Bulbasaur comes out, and I decide to use a Super Potion to get all my health back because I wanted to know how much damage a Vine Whip would do. The answer is more than half my health, which means I cannot possibly beat the Bulbasaur like this. Plus, with all the sand attacks the Pidgeotto was able to use, I didn't even hit with my tackle, so I don't know how much damage that would have done. But this will not work. I would need to heal every turn just to survive, and I would never get a chance to attack. So, I'm gonna have to level up to level 30. Which meant I learned the move Flail. And let's talk about Flail, because it's an interesting move. 
flail's power is determined by how much HP you have remaining. And here is the actual chart to show you the range, which goes from 20 base power to 200. But what's important to recognize is that you need to be at about a third of your health before flail becomes a better move than tackle. Sure, it's five base power better, but that's negligible. The fact is flail will need to be used at low health and thus I'm going to be carefully managing my HP for the rest of the run for difficult battles. And let's take a look what happens when I don't do that. So I go into the battle at full health and just try to knock out the Pidgeotto as quickly as possible. So I use a combination of tackles and flails and I'm able to knock out the Pidgeotto at 15 HP. So using our handy flail calculator, which will be displayed on the screen now periodically, you can see that my flail is now at 80 base power. So the Bulbasaur comes out, I use flail and it only does half damage. That's not enough. The Bulbasaur is easily able to retaliate and I lose. So I kind of have to figure out exactly how much HP I want to start the fight with so I will have exactly the right amount to take out the Bulbasaur in one hit. But honestly, it was a lot of trial and error because here's an example of where I had too little health. I came in with nine. I use a flail. It doesn't take out the Pidgeotto. The Pidgeotto uses Gust. I go down to three and then it's able to use Quick Attack and you can see me resetting right away. Be aware, I've been at this now for hours. I'm getting very annoyed. And I should mention that unless you get poisoned, which I wasn't able to do, unfortunately, it's not easy to get the exact value you're looking for. But I ended up determining that 13 HP would be the perfect value. And it worked well. If Pidgeotto cooperated. Essentially, what I needed to do, which is what you're watching now, is I would get any attack first turn and then second turn I'd get a quick attack and oftentimes if you're in low health it will automatically go for quick attack the AI is trying to be smart thankfully it would not take me out and I would have exactly one health left which would give me a 200 base power flail which is enough to take out the Bulbasaur in a single hit and the rest of the battle is not too much of a problem especially considering the next Pokemon he sends out is an Abra which has no attacks and can't attack you now, all I needed to do was to remember that Rattata also knows Quick Attack, so make sure you heal. And so after hours upon hours of leveling up and strategizing, finally, Rival 2 is defeated. But my troubles in Cerulean are not over yet. After Nugget Bridge, you have to battle at least one Hiker. I chose to battle the one with the Machop and the Geodude. Now, at this point, I hadn't yet decided exactly how much HP I wanted to have, but I just ended up getting insanely lucky, so it worked out. I got a critical hit against the Machop, even though I wasn't at my max flail, so it took it out in one hit anyway. Then the Geodude comes out, I hit it with a flail, it doesn't do nearly enough damage. I'm clearly not going to win. Hits me with a rock throw, puts me in max flail range, which is good, but I know I'm not going to take it out unless I get a critical hit. And I get that I got lucky here, but after how long it took me to defeat the rival, I'll definitely take it. But there weren't any other fights that were a problem. Until Misty. So I didn't really know what I wanted to do versus Misty. So I just went in at the health I had, which happened to be 10 HP, meaning I was at 100 base power for Flail. And it did not take out the Staryu in a single hit. Luckily, the Staryu didn't attack me. But then she sent out Starmie, and this is when I knew I was in trouble. Because a 100 powered flail was not even doing half health, meaning 200 base power was not taking out the Starmie in one hit. Plus, Water Pulse did at least 10 HP, probably was doing a lot more. Magikarp is not known for its amazing special defense, and Starmie has pretty great special attack. So I had to come up with a plan. I tried fighting Misty at full health, but that didn't really work. So I battled the Starmie again and again and again at various health using different potions. But the biggest problem I was finding is that the Starmie knows recover. So even when I felt like I was making progress, it could just recover. And unfortunately, it was able to outdo me in damage dealt. And I was simply not able to defeat it. So I needed a consistent strategy to take out the Starmie before it could use Recover, or do so much damage that it didn't really matter that it was using Recover. Finally, I came up with a strategy that ended up being effective. So I started with exactly two health, 
used Flail, and took out the Staryu in a single hit. Then the Starmie came out, and I used one Super Potion. And here's where I relied on a little bit of luck. I needed the Starmie to hit me with Water Pulse three times for it either not to confuse me, or for me to never hit myself in confusion. If it used Swift or Recover, it was gonna be tough. This time, even though I got confused, I hit the Starmie, and as you can see, if everything went right, the AI didn't use Recover because it wasn't at low enough health, and since each Water Pulse did around 17 damage, I could make sure I was at 2 health to get off a max powered Flail, and finally, take out the Starmie, and now I can continue to the rest of the game. Oh my goodness, this took forever. But thankfully, after Misty's Gym, the game gets quite a bit easier, and this was true the last run as well. There are lots of trainers here, but I'm so overleveled that it doesn't actually matter. I'm usually able to take out most things in a single hit with a flail, but I do need to be a little cautious when there are trainers with Pidgey or Rattata that know Quick Attack, because if I'm at too low health, they'll be able to knock me out. But overall, this part of the game was very easy, and I was able to gain some valuable experience points and make my way to the SSN, where I have to fight the rival once again. And at this point, because I'm at such a high level and I already have Flail, the battle is far easier. I just had to figure out exactly how much health I wanted to enter the battle with. I decided on 7 because Pidgeotto will always use Quick Attack, which does 5 damage, giving me a max powered flail, and I can faint the Ivysaur, heal up the Raticate, and nothing else is a problem. Just use Tackle or Flail against the Raticate and the Kadabra, and I have plenty of potions if I need them, but I really didn't. And so I was able to get cut and proceed to the rest of the game. Now, just like last time, I decided to leave Lieutenant Surge for later. There's no real need to fight him right now. I'd rather be at a stronger level because electric type attacks, especially if I get hit with a static ability, not going to be a fun time. So I continued on to Rock Tunnel, fought some trainers, and for the most part, none of the trainers are too much of a problem until Rock Tunnel, which is a part I actually thought would be difficult in the last run, but thankfully, all the Geodudes and Gravelers use Self-Destruct, which made it really easy. Well, even though this Geodude that's level 25 should know Self-Destruct, it never uses it. I don't know why. Maybe it doesn't know it, but it did not use Self-Destruct a single time. And so you have two options. You can fight the one hiker with the level 25 Geodude, or another hiker that has a Machop and an Onyx, and the Onyx is actually really annoying because it knows Harden, which raises its defense, Screech, which lowers my defense, Bind, which does just a little bit of damage every turn, and Rock Throw, which does just enough damage to give me real problems. Even with all my potions, it's very, very tough to beat this thing. In the end, I elected to fight the Machop Onyx. I went in with 5 health and used a 150 base power flail to knock out the Machop in one hit, and then with the Onyx, I'd been at this for 15 minutes, so I just tried to hit it, not really caring if I fainted or not, just hoping I got a little lucky. Finally, after a couple of lucky misses, I decided, okay, it's time to heal. And then, slowly but surely, I just kept attacking it, and eventually, it went down. But this took a really, really, really long time. This was a very frustrating battle. And it was not the only mandatory hiker fight you actually have to do here. You then have to fight this hiker who has three Geodudes, all level 19, and a Machop. This time I actually used an X attack. I was saving it for this fight. You cannot purchase them at this point, but you do get one along the way, which is why I have one for this battle. But I could only use it once. And I actually went in with full health because I needed a turn to set up the X attack and it's going to be doing damage. It just seemed to make sense. I always try it full health, just because it's easiest to do it that way. And it ended up working. You don't do too little damage, even though they're rock type, but they do know Harden, so that can be a little frustrating. The real difficulty here is getting past that first Geodude at a decent health. You just use Tackle until Flail starts doing more damage. And then, once you get past that first Geodude, you start doing a lot more damage to the subsequent Pokemon. So this battle honestly wasn't so bad, but we have one more Rock-type battle coming up, 
and this one was actually the worst of all of the ones I'd done so far. Because this guy has two level 21 Geodude, and then a level 21 Graveler. Which, if you thought Geodude's defense was good, Graveler's, unsurprisingly, is much better. Now, you might be wondering, J. Rose, why don't you just use Struggle? That's how you beat Brock. And the real answer is, I didn't want to spend all that time. And I didn't even know if it would work effectively. Because think about it. With Struggle, I have to use up all my splashes, all my tackles, that's 75 PP, plus I have to use up all the 15 flails. That's going to take a really, really long time, and I can't go to the Pokemon Center in between and I have to waste my potions. That's not something I was looking forward to doing. I wanted to see if I could do this using more normal strategies, and eventually I did find a way. What I needed to do is use an X defense to start off the fight. And then the strategy is simply to get lucky, because beyond having Harden, which makes this fight a lot more difficult, they also know Magnitude, and Magnitude varies in power from a really weak attack to an unbelievably strong attack, meaning I couldn't exactly predict how much damage I was going to take, which makes it very hard to know into Potion which is super important for a flail user because I want to be at the lowest HP I possibly can, but I could always be knocked out if they got a really good roll on magnitude. So this fight took me forever. Finally, I started playing a little conservatively, at least for the most part, but I would use tackle until it made sense to use flail. And then when I didn't feel like risking it anymore, I would heal and slowly but surely, eventually you start to actually do damage and it's not the first two geodudes which are that big a problem but that graveler even with powerful flails it's gonna get up a few hardens this just took forever not only did it take me many many attempts to actually beat this guy but it took so long i mean look at my tackle pp i know it's going quick so you might not be able to see it but you can definitely see it's going into the yellow i am using like 20 to 30 tackle pp per fight like this is absolutely obnoxious but thankfully this is the last mandatory horrible hiker fight that i have to do for the rest of the run because once we get past this guy we can make our way eventually after fighting a few more trainers along the way but no hard trainers or mandatory hikers we can get to celadon city and in Celadon City, we get access to the items that make this run possible, the battle items. Now, in addition to HP management, part of my strategy is to decide which battle items to use, when, and how many. And a good example of where this comes into play is the Giovanni fight in the Team Rocket hideout. Now, Giovanni on paper looks really tough. He leads with an Onyx, has a Rhyhorn, both of which are rock Pokemon, and a Kangaskhan. But thankfully, he's not as much of a problem as those hikers are because we have X item. So what I decided to do, and I realize in retrospect I could have even done something different, is I used two X attacks. Why just two, not six? Because Onyx knows Harden, and it's actually way more important to start attacking the Onyx as soon as possible because once it starts setting up Hardens, it doesn't matter how many X attacks you use, you're going to be doing like no damage. So once again, I use Tackle until Flail starts to do better damage, and once it does, it actually does some pretty decent damage to the Onyx, and especially the Rhyhorn. You can see how great Onyx's defense is. Rhyhorn isn't nearly as bulky and is quite easy to take out, but it did get in a Tail Whip, which would come into play. The Kangaskhan came out, and I was worried, so I decided to heal, and good thing I did, it used Fake Out, and then... What I decided to do is to play it safe. Once I ran low on health again, I healed again, and thankfully it just decided to use Tail Whip like three times in a row, and that was the Giovanni fight, which for the next little while is one of the hardest fights. Of course, excluding another really hard fight that I have to do, the fight that almost ended my run last time, even though it ended very shortly after, Erica and her Grass Pokemon. So before I fight her, I'm going to battle every other trainer that I haven't fought yet, including going back to Vermilion City and fighting Lieutenant Surge. And at this level, he really isn't a problem.
The only thing I had to really figure out is exactly how much HP I wanted to go in with. If I picked a really low amount like 3, well the Pikachu knows quick attack and it would take me out. In retrospect, I actually got really lucky and probably should have gone in with a little bit less health, probably like 11 or so, because 14 if you look at the chart, I'm still only doing 100. I should have probably gone for 150 because when I hit Lieutenant Surge with an 80 base power flail, it did about two thirds. So in my successful battle, I probably wouldn't have won without a critical hit. I think it would have just survived. So I guess I got a little lucky, but the truth is I could have also used an X attack I was honestly at this point trying to be as reckless as possible because, well, I've been at this for a while and yeah, even I get frustrated at some point and need to find little ways to keep the run interesting. So I artificially made the fight tougher than it needed to be. Probably got a little lucky in this instance, but I think I would have beaten him no problem with like the tiniest bit of actual strategy. Speaking of which, I have to fight the rival again, but with battle items, he's quite a bit easier. So I decided not to heal and was at the same 14 health that I went into the last battle with. And after losing a couple of times, I came up with this strategy literally in this fight. I used an X attack, healed with a super potion, and then used a guard spec, which prevents your stats from being lowered, specifically accuracy from sand attacks, and intimidates because he now has two Pokemon with intimidate, Gyarados and Growlithe. I set up a few more X attacks and then just kept using flail. I was at only an 80 base power flail, but with those X attacks, it took out the Ivysaur in one hit. It didn't take out the Gyarados in one hit, but Thrash didn't knock me out, so I was fine. And then of course the Growlithe and Kadabra were absolutely no problem. And if this were the last run, I wouldn't be able to really go much further because we wouldn't be able to hit ghost Pokemon with any of our moves. Flail is also a normal move, but thankfully it's not generation one and struggle is a typeless move. So it's time to go and waste all our PP. And this takes a really, really long time to do that. By the way, at least for splash, what I decided to do is find another magic card because they always appear when you use the old rod and they can't fight back. So they're pretty nice to fight against. And then what I actually did is there were a couple trainers I had left because I figured there's so much experience in Fire Red, I didn't really need to fight the ones that took forever. So I actually went back and fought a couple hikers because what a great way to waste all my tackle and flail PP. And eventually I got everything down to zero. If you're wondering where the move deleter is, they're not available until like the end of the game. So we're not going to be able to do that at this point you have to kind of use up all 90 of your PP. It's really, really, really tedious. But we can fight ghost Pokemon, so it is worth it. And unfortunately, the fights are really boring. Uh, Struggle does 50 base power, Ghosts of Horrible Defense. I'm hilariously overleveled. They are not a problem whatsoever. The only thing to remember, and I had this written on a big piece of paper, is not to step in the healing zone because that would be brutal. However, once you fight all the channelers and there is no risk of fighting another one, you can then heal up and fight the Marowak, then the Team Rocket members, and then you can get the Poke Flute and continue to the rest of the game. But before we do that, might as well go and fight Erica, right? Now, if you remember last video, she gave me a lot of problems and with Flail, I figured it would be a little bit easier, plus I'm even a little bit of a higher level, so that should work, right? But I went in with as little health as possible, none of her Pokemon no quick attack, so I don't need to worry about that. I used a max powered flail, and it didn't faint. Meaning I had two options, one, hope for a crit, which feels like kind of cheap, or two, just level up a little bit more and then beat her. I guess that's kind of cheap also, but I elected for number two because I had to go and level up anyway for the rest of the game. But yeah, I level up to level 50 and go to fight Erica again. And at this point, it's what they call a range, meaning the attack has a chance of knocking it out on one hit. Pokemon attacks don't always do the exact same amount of damage every time out. So essentially I had to get lucky. I tried a few times and once I got an attempt that knocked out the victory bell, I thought I was good, right? I mean, there's no way anything else tanks the max powered flail, right? 
right? Oh. So I tried again. I used the flail, knocked out the victory bell, and the tangle up with one hit, and then used a hyper potion once she sent out vile plume. Now, for whatever reason, it likes to use acid, maybe because it thinks I'm at such low health. I don't know. It always seemed to use acid here, which was perfect. I then use an X attack. She used stun spore usually, so I would use a paralysis heal. Then she'd usually use Giga Drain. Now, this was not guaranteed to happen. In fact, this was, I think, my third try. But if Acid and Giga Drain did just the right amount of damage, Magikarp would survive and would be in range for a max powered flail, which would take out the Vile Plume with the X attack bonus. But this actually took me a really long time, and I probably could have leveled up more, but I wanted to really see if I could do this at level 50. But now, finally, we can see the rest of the game. And at this point, the game actually becomes a lot more frustrating. Not difficult, not challenging, but frustrating. And the reason why is simply that prior to this point, most of your opponents, other than gym leaders, were using pre-evolved Pokemon, all of which have pretty pitiful defenses and don't hit that hard. So I could kind of be lazy, keep Magikarp at very low HP, and just use flail after flail after flail. Well, now, with stronger Pokemon, especially on cycling path like coughing and wheezing, I can't do that. If I try to do that, they'll survive the hit. No longer is everything just going down in a single hit, since Magikarp has very, very bad attack. I, I don't know if you guys knew this. Magikarp is not the most competitive Pokemon. And so I kind of have to just take my time with every single battle. And considering how many more trainers there are from now until the end of the game, it definitely made this part a bit of a slog. And the only real difficult trainers left, for the most part, were the gym leaders. So I spent the next few hours, slowly but surely, battling every trainer I could until I decided it was finally time to take on Koga. And even with all the leveling up I did, the first battle didn't go too great. Max Powered Flail doesn't even take out the coughing. Let alone his fully evolved Pokemon, it wouldn't take out the coughing. That's gonna be a bit of an issue. In addition, setting up against Koga is not a really easy thing to do. His Pokemon all know moves which either raise evasion or lower accuracy. It's part of the whole ninja tricks shtick. So, for example, Coughing Nose, Smoke Screen, which lowers my accuracy, and Muck, if you try and set up on it, will just keep using Minimize until you never hit it. So it was really frustrating trying to find the perfect balance of X items, health, and making sure Koga's Pokemon don't evade every single attack I use. So after thinking about it for a bit, I decided to go in at full health and set up on the coughing since it can't actually raise its own evasion, it can just try to lower my stats, which I can block with the guard spec. So I would start by using a guard spec, then I would start using X attacks unless I got poisoned or ran too low on health. And eventually the guard spec would run out and I'd need to use another one, but I just kept at it until what ended up happening is that the coughing got me to this perfect health, exactly two health, which put me in max flail range. I'd already used a few X attacks and I figured this was as good a chance as any as I had to sweep through his entire team, and I did. And for the record, that critical hit against the muck didn't really matter because I didn't get one against the Weezing, and Weezing has better defense than Muck. But this fight was a really good example of trying to use all the tools I have, which aren't very many, to get the best possible outcome, and trying to avoid the strategy of just get to a super high level, you'll one-shot eventually. It's way more fun to try and figure out strategies like this. And now that I've defeated Koga, I can go into Safari Zone, get Surf, and then battle a bunch more trainers until I'm at a decent enough level to get through Sylph Company and battle all those trainers. And so once again, I spent a pretty long time doing that. But in Sylph Company, there are a couple difficult battles. 
including yet another exciting battle with the rival. Now, the good news is Pidgeot no longer knows Sand Attack, but the bad news is it does know Feather Dance, which sharply lowers attack, so I still have to use Guard Specs. And the strategy here was to simply set up enough X attacks to sweep through the rest of the team. Unfortunately, it still knows Quick Attack, so when my health gets too low, it uses Quick Attack, and I have to start all over again. So I have to be very cognizant of how much health I have and whether I need to heal or not. But the truth is, that only happens if I get unlucky. If I get regular luck, meaning no critical hits, what will happen is I'll use a guard spec and the Pidgeotto just goes for wing attack, does consistent damage, and I can usually set up four X attacks and then on the final turn, use a guard spec. And then even with a base 100 flail, which I had in this case, with the four X attacks, I'm able to take out the Pidgeot, the Venusaur, the Gyarados, and by the way, with the guard spec, the Intimidates don't happen for the Gyarados or the Growlithe, which is very helpful, and the Alakazam, which has some good speed, but I'm at a super high level, and it has pretty paper-thin defenses. So, all in all, the fights with the rival are getting a little bit easier. <laughs> don't worry, that'll change uh, at a point I think you can expect, but for now, let me be happy with the fact that I can beat the rival without it taking like 10 hours. Speaking of which, the next battle you'd expect to be difficult is Giovanni, but he's actually way easier this time because instead of an Onyx, he leads with Nidorino, which has really poor attack, and the only real risk is it poisoning you, but it deals such little damage. Thankfully, I'm able to set up all six of my X attacks, plus heal any poison damage, and eventually it got me down to 20 health, which is again a base 100 flail, and it's able to knock out all three of the Pokemon that don't resist it, like Nidoqueen and Kangaskhan. The Rhyhorn, however, didn't go down in one hit, but thankfully it used Stomp. I still had some health left, and I was easily able to take it out on the next turn. And this was actually my first attempt at Giovanni, so no complex strategy here. This is the first thing I tried, and it worked, so that works for me. Speaking of which, Sabrina, even though she can be a difficult gym leader in many runs, that's not the case here, because my Magikarp outspeeds all her Pokemon, and you don't even need an X attack, not a single one. I went in with 7 health, just because I happened to have it, which puts me at 150 base power for Flail. Every single one of her Pokemon, one shot, because I'm at a much higher level, and Psychic Pokemon not known to have the greatest defense. So, uh, that felt pretty good, and I was starting to think, hmm, Maybe the run will be easy. Do I even need to make a video on this? I mean, uh, come on. The rest of the run's gonna be just as easy as this was, right? Well, to help it stay easy, I actually went on a bit of a detour and started catching Pokemon because there is an aid in this game. If you catch 40 different species of Pokemon, you get the amulet coin, which doubles the amount of money you get in battle. Money is actually gonna become very, very important since we need so many different types of items. So maximizing the amount of money I can win, super important. But the rule still applied. I still was only able to use Magikarp. So it was a little more tedious than I would have liked, but I needed the amulet coin to make this run bearable. So then I went through the Pokemon Mansion and battled all the trainers in the Cinnabar Gym until finally I was at Blaine. And although you'd probably expect this to be the easiest gym, I actually didn't beat him on my first try because Blaine sends out Growlithe, and Growlithe has Intimidate, and in and of itself that's not a problem, but it also knows Fire Blast, and seeing the damage Fire Blast can do, even though I'm so overleveled, and it's not very effective, it demonstrates just how poor Magikarp's special defense is. However, the strategy was simple. I would use a couple X attacks, heal when my health got too low, and I used three more. But that's only like using four in a regular battle because of the Intimidate, and then it happened to get me to 7 health. I don't know why again 7 health. Once again, 150 base power flail. It took out his next two Pokemon. I was a little worried about the Arcanine, but I thought I'd be able to take it out in a single hit. And I was able to, even though it also gets off an Intimidate. And so I can't say first time once again. This was second time, streak broken. But in this run, second time is 
It's decent. I, I would say it's decent. Now, in vanilla red and blue, at this point, you would go over to Viridian and fight Giovanni. But in fire red leaf green, you have to go to the Sevi Islands and complete a little side quest. And by the way, the Sevi Islands have a lot of useful stuff that I won't be able to use in this run. Um, and so there's a bunch more trainers to fight, and you have to find this lost girl and return her to her father. A truly original plot point, I know. But once you finish with all that side quest stuff, we are ready to go to the final gym and face Giovanni for the third and final time. Now, Giovanni once again leads with a different Pokemon. This time it's his Rhyhorn, and the Rhyhorn has very interesting AI. It will keep using Scary Face until it hits, I assume. I knew it had Scary Face, so I let off with the guard spec, and it just kept using it every single time allowing me to set up all six of my X attacks. And then, I guess once it ran out, it started using Earthquake. And this wouldn't have been a problem if he didn't get a critical hit, which I wasn't anticipating, and so I lost the battle. But the second time around, I actually got a critical hit, which I was worried would be a problem, but I was able to take out the Doug Trio with a single tackle, which truly felt amazing. Of course, the tackle did not one-shot Nidoqueen, which has pretty decent defense, but it did put me in range for a base 100 power flail, and I was hoping that would be enough to sweep through the team, but even though it took out the Nidoking, the second Rhyhorn has smarter AI. Flail only knocked off half of its health, and it was easily able to retaliate with an Earthquake, and I have to try all over again. And I really wanted this to be my last attempt, so I decided to change my strategy and make sure I would win. So I actually unequipped my amulet coin and equipped a Petra Berry, which will heal me from poisoning since both Nidoking and Nidoqueen have poison points as their abilities, meaning there's a 30% chance when I hit them with a move that does contact, like Flail, I'll be poisoned. And that mattered because I had a bit of a different strategy for dealing with the Rhyhorn. I was still going to be using guard specs and setting up X attacks, but I decided to throw in a dire hit and some X defense. The dire hit for a lucky crit chance, and the X defense help out both by defending me against the Rhyhorn. This time, for whatever reason, its AI decided, no, no, attack him. This isn't working. Let's attack. And the other Pokemon, and I can manipulate my health a lot better this way. After I finished setting up, I was at 31 health, and I decided to attack with an 80 base power flail. It retaliated with an Earthquake, and that put me into base 100 power range. And so then I was able to knock out the Rhyhorn, the Doug Trio, the Nido Queen, and the Nido King. I didn't need the Petra Berry, but it was good to have it just in case. But remember how I said I used that Dire Hit just in case I got lucky? Well, I got lucky, and the second Rhyhorn didn't even have a chance to attack because I took it out in one shot. I don't know if the X defense mattered, and uh, I guess I wasted a bunch of Poké Dollars, but hey, I can say that I defeated all eight gyms using just a Magikarp. No speeding up, no emulators, no save states, no, no, no. This was done in real time, and while I felt happy, I started to feel a little bit of dread, because I knew, I knew the most difficult part of the run was coming up very soon. But we still have another tricky battle before then, the second to last rival fight, spoiler alert. And I intended on using a very similar strategy to last time, except I noticed that the rival never actually used Feather Dance. So I stopped using the guard spec and instead started setting up two X defense, since Pidgeot's doing a fair bit of damage and I really would prefer not to heal, since if he doesn't get any crits, it will very likely put me in the 150 base power range for Flail, which should be good enough to take out his entire team. So I finally finish setting up. I use Flail against the Pidgeot. It takes it out. And the moment of truth, will it take out the Venusaur in a single hit? It does. But then he sends out his Rhyhorn, and I'm not convinced that I would be able to one-hit KO it. And then it would either one-hit KO me with a single attack or it would get a crit. So I decided to play it safe and use a fresh water so I wouldn't gain too much health, but enough to set up a guard spec for the Gyarados and the Growlithe that are coming up. And Rhyhorn kept using takedown and it actually put me in a very, very good position to use Flail against the Rhyhorn and then against the Gyarados, the Growlithe, and finally 
the Alakazam. And that is it for difficult trainers. Until, of course, the Elite Four. But let's take a moment to appreciate how far we've all come. I mean, of course, I did the run, and you've sat and watched it, or at least highlights of it, for an hour. And I know I joke around a lot, but I'm dead serious. If it weren't for the fact that I knew so many people wanted to watch this video, there were points where it was very tedious and would have been easy to give up. But knowing that people enjoy these videos so much, it's pretty motivating, even when I have to go and, you know, fight like a billion Metapod or something. But that's like 50 minutes ago. We're now ready to get through Victory Road, head to the Indigo Plateau, and face off against the Elite Four. And before I went there, I actually went and did a big shopping, buying all the items I'm going to need, including X Attacks, X Defends, Dire Hits, X Accuracies, lots of healing items, including Soda Pop, Lemonade, and Fresh Water, which will help me manipulate my HP within battle to some degree. So, starting off is Lee, and she leads off with Dugong. And the strategy for Dugong is actually kind of simple. My goal is to set up 6 X attacks, heal when my health gets too low, and at this level, each of her 2 attacks, both Surf and Ice Beam, do about 43-44 damage, give or take. So, it actually works out that I should, after I use my 6 X attack, have the perfect amount of health to sweep through her entire team with a 150 base power flail. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work. It did in this case, but if she got a crit, sometimes hail, which she can use, would mess things up, and sometimes she would just get really bad ranges on her attacks, and I wouldn't be able to sweep through her team, which could cause kind of a problem because Slowbro and Lapras can actually be kind of problematic if I don't get rid of them quickly. In this example though, it went well. Usually it went well, but there was still like 30% of the time that I would have to start all over again. So it was definitely a very frustrating part of doing this. And yes, I did this like at least a hundred times. But after Laura Lee comes Bruno. And Bruno leads off with an Onyx that knows Earthquake, Rock Tomb, Iron Tail, which it never should use, and Roar. You might also notice that all my Tackle PPs are used up here. That's intentional, but don't worry about that for right now. So, I heal before I enter the Bruno fight, obviously, and this time I start off by using an X Defend. And once he uses Rock Tomb, I need to use a Guard Spec, because although one speed drop doesn't actually hurt me any, I still will outspeed his entire team, at 3, he will start to outspeed me, so I need to be very careful. Anyway, the Onyx part is incredibly tedious. It's just setting up X attacks, refreshing the guard spec because it only lasts 5 turns, and if necessary, using the appropriate healing items to try and get my flail in the best range possible. If it's at base 150, it will one-hit KO everything on his team except for the Machamp and the second Onyx. So, when he sends out the Machamp, I would oftentimes heal. Now, because I've used quite a few X Defense, sometimes one, sometimes three, it depends on how the battle went. I believe in this example I used two or three. I would just keep using Flail until I ran out, because I need to run out of moves anyway, and it actually makes things easier against the Onyx. So, once I ran out of Flail, I would start using Struggle. Uh, the Machamp, it does have a Citrus Berry, and they do sometimes heal with a Full Restore which is really annoying, so I need to be careful not to get the Pokemon in the range for them to use a full restore. But thankfully, it's not too big a problem. I have plenty of healing items myself, and if I just keep using Struggle, the Machamp won't be a problem unless it gets a crit. By the way, all these strategies are ruined by getting a crit. I use Dire Hits, by the way, oftentimes when I'm wasting a turn. I think I used one in this battle, because crits are nice, and I believe I got one against the second Onyx, it's a lot stronger than the first Onyx. It has Earthquake, Double Edge, and Sand Tomb. It can be actually really annoying, but thankfully it didn't get any crits. See, the big thing in this fight is no crits. If I don't get any crits, Bruno is actually, I would say, the easiest fight. And once I got past Laurelee, I usually was in the clear. And you might be noticing something. I'm not saving in between fights. This is intentional. 
this was always a rule in my challenges as a kid. When you got to the Elite Four, just like in Pokemon Stadium, you have to fight every single trainer consecutively. No luck, no randomness. You had to beat all five in a row. And if you couldn't do that, then your strategy obviously wasn't good enough. So I will never be saving in between fights. I will always just be going right on to the next fight. And if I lose, I start all over again. Anyway, Agatha is really, really, really obnoxious because she has a Gengar that knows Shadow Punch, Toxic, Double Team, and Confuse Ray. So I start off with an X Defend just to allow me to take more hits. It really helps out, especially because I don't need to manipulate my health this time. And then I need to set up 6X Attacks and 6X Accuracies because she's going to use Double Team a lot and the X Accuracies will counteract her Evasion Boost. The only other thing I need to worry about is being poisoned and confused. I have plenty of full restores, full heals, and I even bought some antidotes. And knowing when to heal is, well, honestly, it's one of the most important parts of this fight. Because the AI's program that if you're not confused, you're not poisoned to try and hit you with a confuse ray or a toxic. So I want to end up on my last turn being able to attack right away. Unfortunately, struggle is not a very powerful move. So it does take multiple hits to take out the Gengar, which is a little frustrating and she can even heal, but the Gengar shouldn't be too much of a problem. The one thing that could happen and did happen here is you might go into the Golbat fight poisoned. If you're confused, that's a problem. If you're poisoned, don't worry too much about it because I actually always heal here since I need to be cognizant of the fact that if I get a crit, that'll be a ton of recoil damage. And if they get a crit, that could actually knock me out. So I need to be very careful. Golbat isn't too annoying. Arbok is a little more annoying. Arbok has Screech, so I do use a guard spec at some point, and it also has Intimidate, and I do want to have my attack maximized. So I do set up another X attack, and then when appropriate, I heal. And then the strategy is pretty much just you struggle again and again, now, the second Gengar might use Hypnosis a bunch, which is kind of good because it doesn't hit often and it's not attacking you. Again, make sure you heal here. You can't risk losing the battle to recoil damage, and it will take two hits to take out the Gengar, even with the Citrus Berry. And finally, she'll send out her Haunter. Haunter is super easy. If you have enough health to withstand the recoil damage, one hit should take it out with or without a crit. So that's it for Agatha, and the truth is, her and Bruno are pretty consistent. These strategies tend to work. You can get an unlucky crit, but if you're smart with how you heal and always keep the possibility of a crit in mind, you should be fine. However, after using something like an Aether on Flail, because we're gonna need it, we have to face Lance. And Lance is unbelievably difficult. All his Pokemon are good, but the Gyarados specifically is a real issue. Gyarados knows Bite, Dragon Rage, Twister, and Hyper Beam, but Bite, funny enough, is the big problem. You see, I know I've been speeding up the footage so that you can see the entire fight, and you may not have caught on to this, but the X defense I've been using in the last couple fights have really lessened the amount of damage that the Onyx and the Gengar can do while I set up for many, many turns. Unfortunately, in Generation 3, there is no X special defense, this means I cannot lessen the amount of damage Bite will do, which is roughly 40 damage, which doesn't sound too bad, but when you consider the fact that a regular Bite plus a critical hit Bite could be enough to take out my Magikarp, it makes this fight incredibly scary. In addition, 40 or so damage is very difficult to manipulate for a good flail, and the rest of Lance's team is even stronger and more of a problem than the Gyarados, which doesn't bode well for us because the Gyarados itself is a big problem. So what I do is set up 7x attacks, which you may have seen, I know the footage is going fast. And then once I can manipulate my health as well as I can, I then will start using Flail. Don't forget, the Hyper Beam can also deal a great deal of damage. So you kind of want to get rid of the Gyarados as soon as possible. The more turns the Gyarados stays around, the more opportunities there are for bad luck and this entire Elite Four run to be over, which is actually really stressful. Anyways, after knocking out the Gyarados, 
Lance sends out his Dragonair, which you think would be easy. So I heal the first turn and he uses Outrage. And here my run ended on a mistake. I should have used a Soda Pop. I wasn't thinking and I used a Freshwater and the Outrage easily was able to take me out. And the run was over. And you might think, well, just try again, right? But I couldn't reliably get past the Gyarados. I would get to the Gyarados every so often and keep in mind, each attempt took about 20 or so minutes, but time and again at my current level, the Gyarados just proved too difficult to set up on, and without setting up on the Gyarados, I wasn't going to be able to take on the rest of Lance's team. It was just not a reliable strategy, which is why I need to level up more. I needed to make sure that Bite did a little bit less damage, but eventually I did get back to Lance and was able to get past the Gyarados once again. Now, at this point, I'm starting to play incredibly conservatively, and there's a good reason. I have spent now hours on this. I don't want to lose. I've made it all the way back here. Let's play it safe. So I wait out the Outrages, and I'm waiting for Dragonair to use Hyper Beam because that gives me two turns to attack or to hit itself in confusion. And I actually used Tackle for the first time in a really long time because Dragonair doesn't have amazing defense. So two tackles or a tackle with a crit will take out the Dragonair. And I went to the Dragonite with full health. I was safe, I had full health, and a single Outrage did 120 damage. Which is the worst case scenario because I'm not going to be able to set up against this thing and Flail is only base 100 power so I just decided to go for it and it almost took it out but not quite and so I needed to either try again and hope it hit itself in confusion and use a couple tackles but what if it got a crit like you don't understand these crits would just ruin seemingly perfect runs and that's a part of the game I need to work with that so instead I decided I'm just going to level up as much as I can. And keep in mind, Magikarp levels up extremely slowly. This takes a really, really long time. I'm not using cheat codes or anything. So I got it up to level 92 and I tried once more. And this was not looking like a good run. Everything went wrong against Loralee. I kept trying to manipulate my health and it just wasn't working until the point I just said, you know what, I'm frustrated let's just knock this thing out i'd already gotten up the 6x attacks i tried my best and it didn't work then the cloister came out and i'm just you know what let's just keep attacking let's keep attacking whatever we're gonna play really really aggressive here because it is only the first battle let's see what happens and for whatever reason the cloister decided it didn't feel like attacking me so that was nice but where this battle actually became winnable was when i got this crit against the slowbro because with the base 100 power flail, Slowbro was going to take me out with whatever move it used. Then the Jinx came out, and even with a 100 base power flail, Jinx has pretty brutal defense, so it fainted in just a single hit. And then the Lapras came out, and I decided to try for some health manipulation strategies. So I used a couple fresh waters and a soda pop, and then I attacked the Lapras after I had the soda pop. It did a little bit of damage, and it put me in perfect range to take it out once it attacked me with either Surf or Ice Beam. It really doesn't matter which one, so long as Ice Beam doesn't freeze, that can be kind of frustrating, but it worked and I made it to Bruno. Now the Bruno fight was very similar to the one you saw last time. I started off with the guard spec, used an X defend, used X attacks, refreshed the guard spec, and then eventually when I was at health I deemed good enough, I started attacking the Onyx. I actually got a pretty lucky critical hit, which is great because the fight with Onyx can take a long time, but it did have a bit of a negative consequence later on. Anyway, the Hitmonchan and Hitmonlee, even at only base 100 power flail, one hit KO, perfect. Now, I know I'm not going to one hit KO the Machamp, so I decided to heal. Unfortunately, of course, it decided to use Scary Face, but thankfully, I still will outspeed everything so long as I guard spec right now and don't get another speed drop. And then I just kept using flail and... The Machamp actually went down this time where I still had Flails remaining. So I had to use Flail against the Onyx, but eventually I was able to use Struggle. Unfortunately, I played it a little risky and you can see I cut it extremely close 
I don't know why I didn't anticipate Onyx healing there for some reason, but if I would have gotten a critical hit, I actually would have lost the fight. Thankfully, I didn't, and I was able to use one last struggle, and once again, I've defeated Bruno. Now on to Agatha. Now, since I just leveled up, I decided this was the right point to use my rare candies. I really didn't feel like leveling up and finding a bunch more trainers, so I kind of used those other two fights to get a little bit more experience points, which explains why I was a little reckless with Lee. I really wanted the experience points, even if I didn't win, but I only had six, meaning I was at level 99, and it's not quite level 100, but it's close enough. Now, the strategy with Agatha is the exact same, so I'm just gonna skip the setup part. We don't need to see it again. The big difference comes when I actually attack. I can take out the Gengar in one hit. I unfortunately got a bad range and didn't on my first attack, but the second time I did, I also was able to take out the Golbat in one hit, but that was probably due to the crit. I don't know if it mattered, but either way, that was helpful. Now, when Agatha sent out the Arbok, I decided just to try and attack it, see if I could get a lucky crit, which of course I didn't. So I decided to heal, use an X attack, and unfortunately it hit me with a Screech, but I was anticipating a Hypnosis, so I wasn't too concerned, and that's exactly what happened with the second Gengar. Unfortunately, its defense is still better than the first Gengar, so a single struggle will not take it out. But thanks to its Citrus Berry, she didn't heal it, so I was able to use a second struggle and take it out. And for the Haunter, I did have to heal here because I was at such low health, but once again, a single struggle is all you need. And I've defeated Agatha. But like I said, it's Lance who gave me the hardest of times. And me being at a higher level really makes a huge difference. I also use an X Defend because I'm worried about Hyper Beam. But the big thing is notice how much damage Bite is doing. It's doing around 30 versus 40, meaning a crit would do around 60 versus 80 to 90. This makes the fight a lot safer, but it still can be a nightmare if I get a crit. So even though I wasn't at a good flail range, I decided to start attacking the Gyarados and took it out while I was at 44 health, which isn't going to take out anything in a single hit. But now that I'm at a higher level, and this is key, look how much less damage Outrage is doing. I know, why didn't I just level up the first time? But I kind of want to see if I can beat this at a more reasonable level. Still, I am using a Magikarp. I guess I'm making this hard enough on myself. But dealing only 60 damage, I can manipulate my health to get a base 100 power flail, which is enough to take out both Dragonair in a single hit, but it would not take out the Dragonite. Thankfully, Dragonite's Outrage is doing a lot less damage as well, and so by using Lemonades at the right time and getting a little lucky with damage rolls, I'm able to get a 150 base power flail at 14 health and one hit KO the Dragonite. And no, that crit didn't matter, but at this point, I was genuinely sweating. I actually didn't know what I wanted to do against the Aerodactyl. I had never battled it before, and I was so close to the end of the game, I really wanted to win. So, of course, I'm at 14 health. I'm not convinced I'm going to one-hit KO this thing, so I heal. Better to be safe than sorry, right? Now, I start feeling a little confident because Ancient Power does, like, nothing, so... This shouldn't be too bad. I'm just going to use Tackle, wait till I get to low health. Things should be fine, right? Well, watch this turn of events. It uses Scary Face, which lowers my speed, meaning it now outspeeds me. I, in futility, try and guard spec. It's too late. And then it gets a critical hit. And instead of healing, I decide to try and retaliate. And it uses Hyper Beam. And I survive on two health. At this point, I'm like speechless. I, I don't know what to say. I can't believe that just happened, but who cares? Finally, we're fighting the rival for the last time, and I've beaten him this many times before. I'm really confident it shouldn't be too much of a problem, but I haven't actually faced this version of his team before, so I don't know if the strategy I'm planning will work. So I head into the final fight and just hope it's gonna turn out. Now, he's gonna lead with Pidgeot, and Pidgeot is actually an amazing Pokemon for me to set up against, because it only knows a single attacking move, Aerial Ace, which does physical damage, and he knows Sand Attack again, which could be a problem, but I have plenty of guard specs, so 
that and Feather Dance aren't going to be an issue, and Whirlwind doesn't affect me at all. So obviously as the battle starts, I use the guard spec, then I use an X defend, and then I'm just going to set up X attacks and see how my health is, and as it turns out, my health was at 13, which puts me in range for a 150 base power flail. Is that going to be enough? I'm not sure, but we're going to find out. So this is the moment of truth. Is this going to one-shot the Venusaur? Yes, it does. At this point, I'm ecstatic. I'm actually going to do this. I don't want to get my hopes up, but I'm actually going to do this. Next comes out Alakazam. I outspeed. One shot with Flail. Let's do this. But we have a Rhydon in the way, and Rhydon has pretty good defense, so I am going to need to heal. Now, I want it to be really safe at this point, so I use another X Defend, and I hadn't actually thought about this Rhydon's moveset, but it also knows both Rock Tomb and Scary Face. I got hit with a Rock Tomb and I'm like, oh yeah, guard spec, better do that. And now I'm thinking, okay, I guess I should just set up X defense and try and manipulate my health, right? And that's what I do. So I set up as many X defense as I can. And of course, it's not actually doing much damage. It keeps trying to status me, which isn't working. So if you can believe it, in the final battle, I'm using Tackle once again. I'll keep using guard spec once mine runs out, but I can't believe it. I've been using flail this entire time. Finally, tackle, get in some love in the final battle. This is perfect. It's like full circle. Unfortunately, the champion has like a billion full restores. Thankfully, I've used a dire hit at this point, so I am getting some crits, but this is taking forever. I'm starting to get worried. What if he attacks and gets a crit? I don't want to have to do this again. But after he heals the second time, I'm actually at 80 base power flail, which is twice as powerful as tackle. So I just keep using flail, and eventually, I take out the Rhydon. But at 22 health, with Gyarados's amazing defense, I'm still worried, what if I don't one-shot it? Better heal, let's be safe, let's win. And it's a good thing I did, because this Gyarados knows Hydro Pump, which does quite a fair bit of damage. It 100% if it hit, would have taken me out better safe than sorry for sure. So we trade attacks back and forth. I eventually start using flail once my HP is low enough. But once again, I'm at 28 health. Am I going to one shot the Arcanine? Arcanine also has really good defense. Plus it has intimidate and extreme speed. I'm going to heal. There is no point taking a risk. This is the last Pokemon in the game. And holy moly, is it doing a lot of damage. You can see how much damage that bite and that flamethrower. I set up the sixth X attack. Use Tackle, get an incredibly lucky hit, and Flamethrower takes me down to 21 HP. Flail cannot miss, and I've done it. It's, it's not even at level 100. We did it at level 99. You see, it didn't even have to be as powerful as possible. And we were able to beat the game with just a Magikarp and nothing else. And... Furthermore, anyone I know who's even attempted this has used emulator with speed up and save states and all that. None of that. I wouldn't even save in the Elite Four. This was a legit Magikarp run. I would never have thought this possible. Or why anyone would ever do it, but I just did. And I, I don't know what to say. So this video has been almost 80 minutes long. And... If you've watched this all the way through, well, you're you're a hero. I, I can't believe it, and I'm humbled, and I know this took me forever to make, but I think you can understand why. I really spent a long time trying to make sure this lived up to the incredible hype of the first video. Now, will you do another one? I don't know, guys. Give me another 100,000 likes, and maybe I will. I mean... The one run I never wanted to do is past Generation 4, because at that point, you will lose a quarter of your maximum health. So I don't even know how I'd get past the beginning part, but hey, if you guys want to see it, share the video, like, subscribe, I'm back. We're going to be beating the game with silly Pokemon, catching them all, all that fun stuff. I don't even know what to say. Thank you guys so much. Take care.